Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Love him, hate him. I want you right now, dear viewer, to imagine what a Jordan Peterson fan looks like. Perhaps they are a terminally online man that can't wait to tell a woman, well, actually, or maybe they are trad wives in the making, or perhaps there's three of them hunched around their computers on Discord, male, black. Why would people be mad about that? Now you may be wondering, why are these black youths, these young whippersnappers, watching who is often regarded as a white supremacist? Well, if you give me some time, dear viewer, I shall explain it in this order. So why people enjoy Jordan Peterson in general, why do men in particular like Jordan Peterson, and then why there is a subculture, so to speak, of black men that are watching, you guessed it, Jordan Peterson. So in this video, Jordan Peterson- People ask me like why Jordan Peterson became popular. Jordan Peterson. Another one with Jordan Peterson. Hello and welcome back to the Laytonicals channel. It is I, the Layton in question, and today we will be exploring why men, black men in particular, are fans of, or some are fans of Jordan Peterson. So Jordan Peterson has been in the public eye since around 2017 and so it is not my job, my mission, to convince you one way or the other whether you should or should not like him because quite frankly I don't care. Also <laughs> I'm not being rude. I'm just, it's not the point of the video is what I'm saying. It's more so, of course I need to reference him in part, but predominantly the video is going to be about the cultural, what were the circumstances that gave him staying power? Because, you know, we're in the internet age now. People uh, rise and fall very quickly, almost instantaneously, overnight, you know, sunrise, sunset. And this man is still kicking. And on top of that, because the manosphere is quite big currently, I feel like there are some reasons that overlap with the popularity of that. The same circumstances or similar circumstances that draw people to Jordan Peterson are often the same that draw them to the manosphere. However, whilst I am on the topic of the manosphere, I don't know if you've paid attention, but something is happening with men, and so this is potentially the first in a mini-series revolving around men. I'm very interested in what's happening to sex dynamics because of dating apps, and then further, what is happening to the minds of particularly young men due to an ideology that's being called the red pill. Preface to this video, however, I'm not saying <laughs> Obviously, the Jordan Peterson's audience is predominantly black men. I'm saying there is a particular reason as to why there is an emphasis, why a black man may be drawn to Jordan Peterson in the first place, let's say. What's interesting is that there is a stereotype that Jordan Peterson's audience is, you know, angry, potentially old, certainly white men, but I myself know a myriad of people that fall outside of that, some in real life, some online. I have two female friends that are fans of Jordan Peterson, and then on YouTube alone, there's a myriad of examples of people that don't fit that immutable characteristic, you know, as I said, white man. Lana Blakely, white, yes, woman, <gasps> and even YouTube sweetheart Ali Abdul. What? Ali Abdul supports a white supremacist and enjoys the conversation. The reason why I know this is because there's a black man by the name of Stephen Bartlett that had Jordan Peterson on his podcast, and so I watched that. I scroll down in the YouTube comment section, and there they are, both Lana Blakely and Ali Abdal. And so, you know, disproven, you've been debunked, actually, his audience isn't just white men. Um, <laughs> Loki, Jordan Peterson might have a more diverse audience at the Women's March. Do you remember that? Like a year or a few years ago. The Women's March is too white and that's why I left, head ass. So far, seemingly, you have enjoyed my takes on race and so I thought I'd switch it up one time for the one time and start talking about sex slash gender. Men, why do black men in particular like Jordan Peterson? Not all of them, but some of them is about emphasis. <laughs> Comment section. Let's find out together. <laughs> Jordan Peterson is a lecturer, author, therapist, clinician, philosopher, provocateur. You're just That's saying murderous... things though to provoke, aren't you? I mean, no, you no, are yeah. a provocateur. I, know. I feel like this is true of all people, but in reference to this video, you know, Jordan Peterson. People and Jordan Peterson are Rorschach tests. You see 
what you want to see. Is this a picture of a duck? Or is it a white supremacist super Nazi? Who knows? Relativism is my point. Interpretation of Jordan Peterson aside, hopefully we can all at least agree that when a person reaches a stratospheric level, let's say, they, they don't stop being a person but they definitely take on additional characteristics. They become a symbol, is what I'm saying. And so the question is, a symbol for what? In one camp, you have people that primarily know John Peterson as the uh, as bad boy Peterson, as Jordan Peterson odes feminist with facts and logic type beat. And then the other side, you have people that see him as a uh, daddy Peterson, nurturing Peterson, gives advice Peterson. Out the two, he prefers the latter, you know, he, he seemingly is not a fan of friction, let's say. So this video, uh, as you may imagine, will be focusing on that latter group that I talked about. The people that see him, the Lobster Lord, as a guiding force. But first, boys and girls, I need to introduce two terms that will be relevant for the continuation of this video. And if you're a fan, let's say, of Jordan Peterson, or Carl Jung for that matter, uh, you'll be familiar with. But if not... I'll explain them for you. And those terms are archetype and collective unconscious. So let's start from first principles. You have your conscious mind, you in particular, dear viewer, conscious, what you are aware of residing in your brain. And then you have your unconscious, dear viewer. These are aspects of you that you yourself are not even necessarily aware of, but have a guiding, orienting force on the way that you behave and interact with the world and other people. And so we've gone through conscious, unconscious, and then, baby boy, there is the collective unconscious. And these are the things that are, we're all aware of, but we're not aware that we're aware of them. And then the other term that I said that I needed to outline was the term archetype, which you can think of as a pattern of being, or alternatively for you uh, people that can't see anything outside of the lens of media, you can think of an archetype as a trope. The hero, the lover, the everyman, etc. You can embody an archetype, let's say, and it's why you can digest and understand fiction almost instantly and map your nervous system onto the nervous system of whoever you're looking at. They're being heroic, I understand that impulse. Uh, symmetry, we align. Does that make sense? It better make sense. If it doesn't make sense, I'm gonna hunt you down <laughs> until it does. All right, that was dumb. <laughs> so it seems as though the reason why young Jordan B. Peterson is still around, so to speak, is because there is a there are people individually that had a desire to see this representation to them, and then there turned out to be a multitude of people that shared that similar want. So it was in the recesses. It was in there. You could say that it was in their collective unconscious. And so those people, almost like a frequency, they're looking for it. You know, they're looking for a particular signal. And then young Jordan B. Peterson comes along. And, and makes contact, you know? Here, we, we want a thing, I can give you a thing. I'm not saying that in a manner that's uh, I don't think he was proactive in it, I don't think he looked out for it, but they, they latched on in that manner, let's say, and that's partially where I think the staying power comes from. He is giving something that there is a collective unconscious want to have given to them. So what's he fulfilling? What role is he fulfilling? You know, we're all characters, the world is a stage. It's not. It's a world. Um, so where does the staying power come from? Is it Jordan Peterson owns SJW? I think it's a bit deeper than that. I think to people that are fans of Jordan Peterson, they see him in the archetype of the old wise man. Sometimes it's referred to the sage. There are other words that... Senex, I think I saw, was one of them also off the top of my noggin. Old wise man, sage, Senex, all the same thing. So let me read a thing to you. In literature, the sage often takes the form of a mentor or a teacher to the hero, playing a crucial role in the hero's journey. This type of character is typically represented as a kind and wise older father figure who uses personal knowledge of people and the world to help tell stories and offer guidance that, in a mystical way, may impress upon his audience a sense of who they are and who they might become thereby acting as a mentor. He may occasionally appear as an absent-minded professor 
appearing absent-minded due to a predilection for contemplative pursuits. The most common representation that I see uh, for this, so you can map it onto your brain, so you, you know you know what I'm talking about, is Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, but uh, that's a bit too Caucasian for me. <laughs> That's not actually the reason I haven't watched it. I just haven't got around to it. All right, my mom's a Caucasian. How can I be racist? My mom's white. <laughs> so examples that I came up with of my own accord are Iroh from Avatar, young Iroh type B, and Jiraiya from Naruto. Again, obviously they are fictional examples. I mean, they're real in our hearts, you know, but fictional examples. And so how does this stack up for non-fictional IRL in real life, Jordan Peterson. The sage, the mentor, is somebody that bestows knowledge. And so, seemingly, Jordan Peterson is also one of those people. After all, he was a lecturer at Harvard and also the University of Toronto. But you may say, well, that's an appeal to authority. You can have the role of an educator, but you may not actually be one. Okay, sure, bro. So, you know, that's a top-down assessment, let's say. Let's see one that's bottom up. Interestingly, one of the first drop downs that appears when you search for Jordan Peterson on YouTube is Jordan Peterson motivation. Motivation for what? He's bestowing something. Something you're in point A, you want to get to point B, sometimes you need motivation to get there. You can also look at the products, so to speak, that he sells. He has a thing called self-authoring, which is a thing that helps you deconstruct your life, where you've been, where you want to go, what's holding you back. You know, your dad specifically, but I would imagine, like, I mean, he's changed my life. I've done this. I've done his self-authoring suite three times. I do oh, it at the really? every year. Oh my God. I, I have given it as a gift to everybody that I know. I just think it's so helpful in terms of like getting you in check with yourself and it's it's the most realistic approach to like accomplishing your goals and getting your life on track that I've ever seen. And then the other thing, you know, that cements this kind of sage or old wise man or Senex, whatever. 12 rules for life. Okay. You wouldn't even need to read any of this. You can just look at the book. It's a self-help book. Bro, white background, gold text is a... Are common characteristics of a self-help book. So you know what I realized after the Robin D'Angelo series, bro? White background, gold text. This is a self-help book for people with white guilt. Anyway, he's literally trying to be the second coming of Moses, bro. You know, Moses with the original 15 commandments. Oi. 10! Ten commandments! Ten commandments, twelve rules. Commandments are rules, bro. I am trying to tell you how to have a good life, young Padawan. Is that what it's called? I'm not also... Oh, I'm pissed so many people off. My point... <laughs> My point, though, is he's literally saying it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. You know, usually that's a sword he's giving you, his writing. But sometimes the pen is mightier than the sword anyway. So maybe if I came in contact with a dragon, with a dragon of chaos, um, wow, I just wanted to casual Jordan Peterson impression. <laughs> you need to save your father from the belly of the whale. So if Jordan Peterson's audience see him as the old wise man, the sage, the senex, then who are they? And the answer is fools aspiring to be heroes. The comedian, the fool, the fool is the precursor to the savior. Why? Because you're a fool when you start something new. And you might think that that sounds goofy. I mean the idea that people want to be heroes or heroic. And all I mean is life is so sterile, my bro. When's the last time there was genuine adversity to your, <gasps> my Uber Eats is 20 minutes late. The air conditioning isn't quite doing it. Unless you work, say, in the uh, emergency services, you seldom really embody the hero archetype or even see it oh they want to be heroes why would you ever want to bro we all want to be for the past what over 10 years all the cinema the theater however whatever you call it in your in your native tongue all it's been is superhero movies all right there is so obviously a calling out for heroism bro we're fucking thirsty for it, bro. It doesn't go away just because the world becomes sanitized and safe. The the spirit of the hero doesn't go away, bro. It just gets repackaged. And if there is an ask for it by the collective unconscious, then you see it manifest everywhere. My hero academia, bro. You're literally 
becoming a hero vicariously by watching these characters. Bro, you've put in, maybe not you in particular, but there are people out there that put in <clears throat> 60 maidenless hours into Elden Ring. And you want to sit there and tell me that people, oh, to be a hero, so sick. You want to be a hero. Everyone wants to be a hero, all right? The point is, the spirit is so either suppressed or just not made manifest that Hollywood now will just sell it back to you. There's a frequency from the collective unconscious. We want a thing. Hollywood says, we can sense that you want a thing. Here's a product if you give us money for it. The hegemony reifies, commodifies a lack that they can capitalize upon. You can't experience heroism, here is a proxy. You can't experience true love, here is a proxy. So you have a choice. Are you going to suck the cock? <laughs> Are you going to suck the cock of Hollywood in your heroic spirit, heroic energy, let's say? The, the cum of Hollywood, <laughs> the nut. Are you going to become the hero yourself is what I'm asking. And for those that want to do that, uh, the way to become heroic, let's say, is to adopt responsibility. What happens is if I talk about responsibility, is everyone be, is silent, just like they are now. Silent and, and not moving, right? Focusing, attentive. Say, pick up your responsibility. Pick up the heaviest thing you can and carry it and the room goes quiet and everybody's eyes open and I think that's the secret to a meaningful life and without a meaningful life then all you have is suffering and, and nihilism and despair and all of that and self-contempt. Because if you have no goals, you don't have any positive emotion. I feel like I'm going a bit too Kermit there and I'm sorry for that. Okay, so that was a general overview, let's say, of why people enjoy Jordan Peterson. You know, the motivation, the wise old man archetype, there's a collective unconscious want to perform heroic acts, let's say, and you need courage to do that. Hey, here are the ways that you can become heroic, courageous, etc. General, you know. And so now we have what he does for men in particular. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the zeitgeist, let's say, but we seem to be particularly polarized with men and masculinity. I was about to say lately. It's not really lately. It's been going on for quite a while, you know. That's actually toxic masculinity. You know what I'm talking about, probably, and if not, I've just told you. Pay attention. Some people are saying there's no difference between men or women. Some people saying there are differences between men and women, but they're socialized. Some people are like uh, strict gender roles, man like this, woman like this. There are too many cooks in the kitchen. There are too many voices. It's just kind of radio static. The one side is saying this, one side is saying that. Who are you supposed to be, you know? What does it mean to be a man in the 21st century, you do? In this essay, I will, head ass. Um... <laughs> However way you slice it, there seems to be a crisis in masculinity. Some people say men are too masculine to the point that they become toxic. Some people say that men aren't masculine enough to the point that people are making videos talking about how to know if you're masculine. And I just want to jump in there and say, if you have to watch a YouTube video, <laughs> we're no longer the breadwinners. We're being out earned by women, you know? Uh, we're dropping out of college, out of university, in droves. Which is also having quite the knock-on in the dating sphere for reasons that I may or may not get into in the next video. I know I'm going to get some pushback for this, but I, as far as I can tell, the average man is quite down bad. Down horrendous, one may say. And I know initially you may have your objection of, well, actually, men and patriarchy, they have all the power. Can you put your apex fallacy to one side for a second, my bro? Sure, a lot of the people at the top, so to speak, are men. But conversely, so are a lot of the people at the bottom. Male suicide, male homelessness. Just put your humanities degree away. All right, you know, I was in those classes too. I also felt like I knew the whole world too. Or if you didn't go to university, fucking Twitter or wherever it trickles down culturally. So who's at fault? Who is at fault for the, the down badness of the average man? Part of it, of course, is economical because if the economy is fucked, it's kind of hard to thrive, you know? But then you also have just 
men's dopamine receptors just being fucked from the earliest age, bro. There's an expression about tradition provides a solution for a problem that has been forgotten. Something like that. And I think that is the reason why in tribal times or whatever you would call it, or just pre-modernism, there were almost rituals that would take a boy Two. from a man. And I think that that custom and tradition was in place because if you don't do that, men can just become man children. And that's why <clears throat> the stereotype is gendered. It's always a 40 year old in the mom's basement and not a woman in the 40 year old basement because a man will just or can just piss their life away on meaninglessness and folly. I don't even know what folly means. I feel like I've just heard other people say, and it felt right at the time. So I hope, you know, if it's wrong. For women, biological necessity, you probably need to have your life together by a certain age in the event that you want to hit certain life milestones, you know, having children, family, whatever. For a man, that biological necessity isn't necessarily there. And so, as I've said already, you can kind of just piss away your life if you're so inclined. Or maybe there'll be a pushback to that. That's actually a biological essentialist argument. Okay, do you want to refute it or do you just want to throw words around? Hmm? This isn't just a Western thing. Japan, the, the term that you, they use, I think it's hikikomori. It's as good as you're going to get from me, which is, you know, just a shut in, doesn't interact with the world, media consumption. This is a story as old as time, bro. It is so old, you know, the, the man or boy failing to launch story. It's so old that it's fucking biblical, bro. And if you're not enough and you don't think you're enough, then you have to go where you haven't been. And so that's the first commandment to Abraham. It's like, okay, that, that's a good one. That makes perfect sense. Go to where you don't know. Yes. And from thy kindred. Well, that, what does that mean? It means grow up. He has nothing. Obviously, he's been hanging around dad's shack for a little too long, given that he's 75, right? It's time, it's time to get a fire lit underneath him a bit. So, we have gone over why people in general are attracted, <laughs> why people like Jordan Peterson in general. Then we additionally went over why men in particular may be inspired by, attracted to the messaging of Jordan Peterson. And, you know, as we've just gone over, to do with maturation, to pick up your burden, to take responsibility for something, to be heroic, to be courageous, to grow, to stand up straight with your shoulders back is that the so before i continue because this is where the racial component comes in you know heading why why black men in particular and you know i'm feeling some of you reel back a little oh my gosh he's going to start generalizing about race and that just gives me the ick um if you have seen my white fragility or nice racism review series then you know that i also have an aversion to classifying things as a black experience or referring to black people as though they're a kind of monolith or as though there's some kind of canonical blackness, let's say. And the reason why I'm averse to this is because oftentimes, okay, such and such is a black experience. Well, I'm not black and I experience that. So is it a black experience? Conversely, you can have people refer to something as a black experience, but then you as a black person may not have experienced it. And so again, is it a black experience? You know, however, with some specificity of language, you can put forward an evaluation and analysis to tease out a pattern, let's say. There are certain kinds of people, certain patterns of emergence. So again, as a reminder, I'm not saying that this particular reason that I'm going to get into is exclusively a black thing. I'm just saying there is an emphasis as to why black men in particular may, why it may resonate, why it might hit different, if you will. So what is the pattern? What is the kind of black experience in my estimation that Jordan Peterson is tapping into. I hear you ask. Whatever it is, is represented anecdotally, academically, artistically, and statistically. And so to foreshadow this central reason, I'm going to use some artistic representations for what this key variable is that, as I say, is the, is the, the bottleneck that we're passing through so that everything else makes sense. The representation that I have chosen because it makes the most sense for what is, if there's anything that's canonically black or a canonically black art form, I'm not saying they have to be black to do it, but in terms of the origin, rap music, okay? To foreshadow what this, this, this centralizing piece to the video is, we're gonna do a little bit of rap analysis, pop culture analysis type beat, okay? So I'm going to recite 
the artistic expression of this variable that I'm talking about. I'm going to elaborate upon it in the meantime. Of course, you're free to guess the theme. It should be pretty obvious to you. Honestly, you may not even need me to say the theme. You may already know. You sure already... To me, it's pretty obvious, but you know, I'm a genius. And then after that, I'll tie in more formally how this ties into the, the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. And also, I suppose, some of his, who are debatably his not adversaries, but people that share a similar space. The the manosphere space, let's say. I'm going with who are, in the zeitgeist at least, given the title or crown of representative of a particular kind of black experience. And so the people that I've gone with are J. Cole, Jermaine Cole, and Kendrick Lamar. So this is a song by Jermaine Cole. J. Cole with 1.3 billion with a b the letter after a um the song is called no role models okay that's already a hint first things first rest in peace uncle phil i've just realized how ridiculous this sounds with my british accent you the only father that i ever knew i get my pregnant i'm gonna be a better you interesting what could that possibly mean and then it's kendrick lamar so here's from his most recent release the song is called father time i got daddy issues that's on me looking for i love you really empathizing for my relief a child that grew accustomed jumping up when i scraped my knee because if i cried about it he'd surely tell me not to be weak daddy issues hit my emotions never express myself man should never show feelings being sensitive never helped further down my niggas ain't got no daddy, grow up overcompensating, learn shit about being a man, and disguise it as being gangster. I love my father for telling me to take off the gloves, cause everything he didn't want was everything I was. So the central theme for the slow motherfuckers in the back is fatherhood. What? Are you saying that all black people and children don't have fathers? No. So let's do a little bit of Cultural analysis, artistic analysis. First things first, rest in peace, Uncle Phil. You the only father that I ever knew. A lot of people saw Uncle Phil as their, as a stand-in for their father figure, let's say. If I was to write this in some b b b bullshit essay, I'd be like, Uncle Phil became the archetype of the father to Will Smith, and in doing so, did that for us, the black audience. Still... First class honors degree, bitch. Seemingly, yeah, the no role models. They were issues of the father not being around. Kendrick Lamar's one, seemingly, is about the father is being around, but is too cold, non-expressive. Again, if you have seen either of my series on the Robin D'Angelo books, the ones that are basically like, all white people are racist. There seems to be a canonization, let's say, of what whiteness means, and that's not to be white of skin, in case you haven't seen those, which you should have. Whiteness is an abstract. You can, it's not linked to your skin color, let's say. And similarly, because, you know, if there's a canonized whiteness, presumably there's also a kind of canonized blackness. And I think at least, Artistically, that's canonized in rap. Statistically, the second of the nice racism video, there's the statistic. The majority of black kids grow up without fathers. And then as I alluded to earlier, it being represented uh, academically. In the second episode of the nice racism review, I went over how supposedly the nuclear family is an embodiment of whiteness, even though, when it comes to US stats anyway, Asians are more likely to have a nuclear family than white people are. If you look at marriage rates, the ethnicities or races rather that stay together in these kind of committed relationships, nuclear families essentially, are primarily Asian people. You know, raising children, nuclear family, traditional upbringing, so on and so forth. So to characterize that as an artifact of whiteness, I'm like, what are you smoking, my dude? It also, it seems kind of like a polite or like politically correct way to be like, have you ever noticed how black children don't have their fathers around? What's that? What's that all about? Hmm. So now we've crossed the centralizing theme, we can now branch out with some elaborations. So first of all, let's get a little bit Freudian or honestly just kind of common sensical children grow up and so you know have their, their blueprint their initial blueprint mapped out by the relationship that they have with their parents because after all your mom and dad 
should you have them, are the first man and woman that you ever meet. So assuming that that relationship is a healthy one, they likely create the basis for what it means to be a healthy man, a healthy woman, what that looks like, and also what that interaction looks like, I suppose, as well. What it means, and uh, you know, not to be Gender. normative or anything, but it's probable that your dad is more masculine and your mom is more feminine. So what happens to people that either have a unhealthy relationship with their male figure, masculine figure, or simply they do not have that embodiment present. They're missing the spirit of the father. My point is, it's a tendril. You're always putting out into the world, you know, these flailing tendrils, your feelers out, you know, and if you have that embodiment, spirit, uh, archetype, if you don't have a direct access to it, and as I've been saying, for most people, it's their initial mom and dad, initial mom and dad, as opposed to the five that come afterwards. Um, you have a bunch of people looking for a particular frequency. A lightning rod shoots up, in this case, Jordan Peterson. And in some way, you know, as I said earlier, when you reach a stratospheric level, you become extra human, superhuman. You have, you become symbolic in some manner. You become a conduit. And in so doing, you become a kind of... You, Jordan Peterson has become the internet's father, or to a particular subsection of men. You know, you're reaching out, you are a, a, a father figure for a lot of uh, men without fathers. I think this absence of a healthy masculinity, so to speak, or fatherly role, in reference to this video, it's partially fueling the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. It's also that, you know, he gives advice and whatever it's not just people are mapping onto him for no particular reason it's not arbitrary he's also giving something that resonates with the frequency then also i think it's bleeding into what is referred to as the red pill people looking for a roadmap through life and it's like oh these men are doing it but maybe we'll talk about that another time so the first thing that jordan peterson is offering is a entrance point to that archetype maybe for emulation but certainly because they were perhaps absent of one period had an unhealthy representation of it or just a kind of fickle one and so the additional thing that i think he's offering people in general men in particular and then additionally black men in particular is encouragement it's really something to see constantly how many people are dying for a lack of an encouraging word. Mm. And how easy it is to provide that if you're careful. You know, give credit where credit is due. And to say, you're a net force for good if you want to be. With that being said, however, I should point out that even though we've been talking about masculinity and maleness, Jordan Peterson doesn't even see himself particularly as masculine, which is quite interesting. He self-admittedly refers to himself as having a feminine temperament. I almost got a tear. Well, wow, wouldn't oh, even have a tear. Uh, <laughs> my feminine temperament. <laughs> my feminine goals, your feminine temperament. Yeah. So you contrast that, that hyper-masculinity of a particular kind of black father that is being spoken of in the Kendrick Lamar song that I cited to you earlier with softy... Bro, I've seen Jordan Peterson cry more than I've seen my own dad cry, bro. And then thirdly, and finally, why there is a additional emphasis as to why I believe black man in particular, are gravitating towards figures like Jordan Peterson, is he offers them an alternative narrative. Again, you do not need to be a black man to resonate with this. I'm just saying, as I said, there's an additional emphasis. Black man. Blah, blah, blah. There's been an additional emphasis, certainly within the past 10 to 15 years, particularly online, that the most apt narrative to view black people through is the narrative of the victim. Hopefully you know what I'm talking about. It's the kind of identitarian, there's oppressor group, oppressed group, and it's the white people that are the oppressors supposedly against everyone else, but particularly with black people. And it's also become pretty fashionable to, what would you say, gloat? It's not really gloating, but it's, here's how I am oppressed, here is my Twitter bio, and here are all the things that make my life harder than yours. Give me points now, give me the social clout. Get in, bestie, you're oppressed. <laughs> 
Going slightly off topic, but still on topic. Off topic of the Jordan Peterson, but on topic of the anti-victimization point. I feel like this victim narrative is a fucking psyop, bro. Because there's probably no easier and quicker way to convince people to kind of dilute their vigor and spirit than telling them that they're a victim over and over again. And then, in the event that those people don't believe that they're a victim, they get ostracized. What kind of a fucking society are we living in, bro? You get os- Okay. You get ostracized for not thinking of yourself as a victim. Oh, you must be white adjacent. Oh, you're an Oreo. Oh, actually, I know what's best for you, actually. On a personal note, and I've spoken about this a couple of times before, I I had a racism's done to me. <laughs> Let me do a racism to you, see? Um, this has not happened for over half of my life. I think the last time somebody did a racism to me, I was like 13 years old. And afterwards, life's been pretty schmoove after that. Being black, honestly, has only been to my benefit. Oh, give me a scholarship because I've been oppressed. I'll take that free money, bitch. The only people that have made me feel lesser for the color of my skin, or given me a reason, or made me, or tried to convince me that I should feel lesser, as though that's the normative state for somebody of my complexion, are the woke ones. Oh no, you're oppressed actually, because I learned within the space of an hour during my um, humanities degree that you're actually oppressed, and in the event that you don't believe that, you've actually probably just got internalized racism. You can't even see your own oppression, and so me, as your uh, white savior and white overlord, I was so gripped by this, bro. I have a very vivid memory of being in first year of university. There was a thing that was, I don't know how popular it was, but it was a thing called an oppression calculator, bro. And I was so sucked into this thing that when the group of eight or so that i was with when i didn't get the lowest score what lower class black biracial how am i not the biggest victim there was a part of me that was upset by that bro that's how deep in the source i was bro so when i'm like swatting away this kind of identarian this is who you are shit i've been there bro i've been in the depths and that's why I'm so annoyed by it because I know the psyche of somebody thinks like that and I'm telling you bro those shackles are predominantly mental so yes relinquish your resentment stop being a puppet for the for the above people transcend your state by not being sold the idea that you are most aptly described as a victim frankly you're a mess and you're oppressed in every possible way, including your ancestry and your biology. And the entire sum of human history has conspired to produce victimized you with all your individual pathological problems. It's like, yes, true. So what do you do about that? Get yourself together. Transcend your suffering. See if you can be some kind of hero. Make the suffering in the world less. Well, that's the way forward, as far as I can tell, if there is any way forward. What did you think of the video? Drop me a comment down below, because of course, as usual, I will be snorkeling there. I will say, as, a, as an asterisk, predominantly this video was about having a lack of guidance or a lack of fatherly figure, let's say. Jordan Peterson filled the gap anyway, and is joined by a pantheon of other people who are also filling that gap. Segway, the red pill. I'm contemplating continuing on this series, talking about the red pill and some of the characters that are prominent within that, as well as dating apps, because I don't know if you've heard, dating for men, pretty brutal, so I hear. I believe that that is everything. So, as always, thanks for hanging out with me. I had fun hanging out with you. Parasocial relationship game. 100. Date に来る。